I want to speak to you today on the subject of giving thanks. And I want to use today the book of Luke, chapter 17, the story that Jesus told, that Luke tells about Jesus and 10 lepers. You know, one of the reasons why this story is so important is because the story reminds us that giving thanks is part of our worship to God. It's important. It's necessary. As a matter of fact, it is so necessary that Jesus in this story will heal 10 lepers and only one of them will come back to give thanks. And Jesus is sort of amazed by that. He is taken back by that. Were there not 10 and only one of you comes back? In other words, Jesus understood that and he wants us to know that giving thanks is part of our worship, part of what we do, you know what, as we serve the Lord. So let me read the story to you, and then I want to pull out some truths there that will help us understand why giving thanks is important and how that happens. But notice what the story says in Luke 17, starting with verse 11. It says, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the borders between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and he said, Go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. You know, it's interesting that uh, Jesus, the story is told. But Jesus tells this man, you know, your faith has healed you. By the way, the, the word there, healed, is the Greek word sozo. And it means to be made well, to be healed. It's the same word that you will find in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, and in many other places where it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, so is the same word for, for being saved, for being healed, being made well, being made whole. So it says that this guy gets healed physically, and he comes and he expresses his faith. And Jesus tells him, you know what, your faith has not only healed you, you know what, by, by going and obeying, you were healed. But when he comes back and he shows thanks, God tells him, Jesus tells him, not only are you, your faith healed you physically, but your faith has saved you. You see, it is through faith that we come to Christ. It is through faith that we receive all that God has for us, including healing. One of the questions that you should be asking, I don't know about you, but I ask myself, why did this guy come back? You know, why, why did he do it? Why did he choose to express his love? So what I want to do this morning is I want to pull out three things. I want to point out to you three things about Thanksgiving and about what this guy did and what I believe God is speaking to our hearts during this Thanksgiving season about. First thing I want you to notice is that gratitude produces worship. Gratitude produces worship. Notice this guy comes back and with a loud voice, it tells us in verse 15 and 16, it says, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, some of your Bible says with a loud voice, praise God. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him, there's our word, for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Now there's a couple of things that I want you to notice there. But the most important thing is it was out of gratitude that he comes back. You know, some people, when they read this verse, they choose to focus on the outward expression of his gratitude. So you'll hear sermons about him shouting, about the loud voice. But I think the emphasis isn't on the outward expression. I think the emphasis of the story is on the inward expression of worship. In other words, this guy comes back not to make noise, not just to be heard. But it comes, it, it comes from a heart of gratitude. He was grateful. You know, this leper was grateful for what Jesus had done for him. By the way, gratitude always will lead to worshiping Jesus. Now you say, well, what was he grateful for? Well, he was grateful for his miracle. He was healed. Now, now think about it. This guy gets healed from leprosy. And he comes back and he falls down on his face at the feet of Jesus. He's shouting praises to God. And everyone is looking and thinking this ex-leper shouldn't be around us doing that. You know, how do we know? They're thinking, how do we know he's healed? Why, why is he doing this? But this guy is healed. Verse 15 tells us that, that he, he comes back as he realizes that he's healed. And the word praise is actually the, the word translated glorified. It's the Greek word doxaso, and it means to praise, to magnify, to celebrate. He wants to celebrate. Something good has happened in his life. And he wants Jesus to know, and he wants everybody to know. So that's why he comes back. He is grateful. 
You know, in the Old Testament, there are 11 Hebrew words translated praise. And uh, I want to just share with you seven to give you an idea about what the Bible teaches about him coming back and praising and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ out of a heart of thankfulness. Because gratitude is expressed in our worship. And, you know, the first word I want to call to your attention in the Old Testament that expresses praise or thank you, it's the word toda, toda. By the way, when you go to Israel today, it is the word that they use today for the word thank you. You want to say thank you, you say toda. That's it. Thank you. But in the original Hebrew, it's not only thank you, it's actually a word that means a thanksgiving choir. In other words, a thousand thanks. You know what? It's a choir singing thanks. It is the idea of not only one thanking you, but it's a, it's a thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the word todah. And then there's another word in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. It's the word barak. And the word barak means to kneel, kneel in thanksgiving. That's why one of the greetings of the Old Testament is, you know, you read after every psalm, the Hebrew expression, Baruch Hatad Adonai Elohim. And it's the word that means praise the Lord, I kneel before the Lord. After every song, they would say that, even to this day. The third word is the word Tehillah. Tehillah, and it means to sing a song of thanksgiving. Now, I want you to understand it's Tehillah, not Tequila. Because Tequila will really get you to shout, but doesn't mean you're worshiping. Amen. Tehillah. Notice that. It's a shout. You know what? It's, it's shouting out to the Lord. It's a, a singing a song of thanksgiving. The fourth word that's used in the Old Testament a lot about praise and thanksgiving is the word halal. And the word halal means to give thanks by being clamorously foolish. It is the idea of a shout, of a shout that some people might understand it is a little fanatic. It is, a, it is a clamorous shout that, you know what, it sometimes may appear foolish. In other words, you know what, we get our word uh, hallelujah from there. That's the word uh, halal, hallelujah. And it's expressing, you know what, uh, thanksgiving to the Lord. And by the way, I can say hallelujah in English. I can say it in Spanish. I can say it in Italian. I can say it in any language because it's the same word. It doesn't matter where you go. Christians will say hallelujah, halal. And it actually means, you know what, I'm thankful. It's a clamorous shout that may appear to be foolish and sometimes even fanatical. That's the word. And then the fifth word that is often found in the Old Testament is the word yada. And yada means to give thanks with extended hands. So by the way, it is scriptural. In the Old Testament, you know what? They extended their hands when they praised God and they gave thanks to the Lord. Our sixth word is a word that's samar. And samar means to give thanks with the musical instrument. You know, our worship team, every weekend, they give thanks by using their instruments or their voices. We, by are using our hands, we clap unto the Lord. And then the seventh word that is used is the word shabak. And it means to give thanks in a loud tone. You know what? That word is the one that's translated many times to shout. The Bible says, let us give a shabak, a shout to the Lord. It's the idea of jubilation. It's the idea of celebration. It's the idea of, of just raising your voices. You know what? In, in happiness and in joy unto the Lord. I want you to notice, I tell you all of that because I want you to notice that it's scriptural according to the Old Testament to shout, to extend your hands to God, to kneel, to sing to him. To appear to sometimes even be a little fanatical. To use our instruments in our hands and our voices. You know what? That's biblical. And by the way, the early church were Jewish and they practiced this. This is how they worship. There's a, there's a verse in the Old Testament that, that incorporates four of these words. And it's a scripture that you know very well. And it's Psalm 100 verse 4. And it says this. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And that's the word tudah. To thou enter his gates with a thousand voices, a thanksgiving choir. Go into his courts with praise. That's the word, tehillah, singing praises out loud, giving thanks, yada, to him, and praise him, barak, kneel or bow before him, before his name. They're all there. All the words are there. Now, now let me sort of read a paraphrase for you. You know what? That, that says this. This is a, a good paraphrase of that verse. It says, enter into his gates with the thanksgiving choir, a hundred thousand voices. And into his courts with singing praises. Be thankful by extending your hands to him. Bless him by bowing or kneeling before his name. Now some of you say, well, Pastor, okay, we get it. What's the point? Are you telling us that we need to do this? No, I'm not telling you that. I'm not trying to, to get every one of you to express your love the same way. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that that's the way we should even praise the Lord. But if you don't do it that way, you know what? That's okay. 
Now, I, I have a very difficult time with people that say, if you're going to worship God, you have to do it the way I say. And they know what I just explained to you, and they're trying to get the church to return to its roots of, of Jewish worship and celebration and jubilee. And, and by the way, they had banners and they danced. And, you know, when we were in Israel this time, we went to church on Sunday, Father's Day, and, uh, you know, the, the, the worship team did a great job. But there were people dancing, and it was beautiful Jewish dancing. And I was paying more attention to the dancers over here than the worship that was going on. But it was beautiful. You know why? It's part of their culture. And while there are those that are trying to get the church to return to its Jewish roots, you know what? We don't have to. We don't have to. You know, one of the things that I have a hard time for people to understand and to get is that, listen, the way you do it and the way I do it and the way they did it, you know what? It doesn't matter because God doesn't look at the expression, the physical outward expression. God looks at our heart. What caught the attention of this leper wasn't that he shouted and he bowed at his feet. It was his grateful heart. And that prompted the question, where are the others? Weren't the others grateful? Jesus is not saying the others should have come and shouted and should have, you know, kneeled down before me. No, they should have been grateful. That's the idea that Jesus is making. By the way, this idea, this notion that we all have to do things the same, you know what? It's not an old problem. It's, it's an old problem. It's not a new problem. Over there in the early church, there was this huge controversy that sprung up early in the church. And the controversy was, should Gentiles serve God and worship God and praise God and do the things that the Jews do? Do they have to copy us? Do they have to do the same things? You know what? Will God accept them? Will God love them the way he loves us, even though they choose to do things different than us? And the answer was absolutely. We have no right to impose upon the Gentile church our practices. There are practices, part of our culture. They are from a different culture. What they do, do, should do is love the Lord, serve the Lord with all their heart, but we are wrong in imposing upon them, they decided, you know what, some of our practices. And by the way, that was solved a long time ago. Why it keeps being a problem today is beyond me. But there are those that look at this and they say, that's the way it should be. So, no, no, no I'm not here suggesting that, that everyone express their love and their praise and worship the same way I do or that we all should do it the same. No, what I'm trying to do is to get you to understand it is right, though, to express our love to God. It is right to be thankful. And one of the ways we express gratitude is through our praise. And, you know, and, and that is important. God looks at that, our praise and our worship. Now, by the way, don't confuse praise and worship. They're not the same thing. Praise is an audible and physical expression of our love for God. That's what praise is. It, is. it is us speaking our love to God. Worship is a lifestyle that acknowledges God in everything and everywhere we're at. Usually we praise when we come to church, but worship is, every, it, it is honoring God and loving God at our job. It is reflecting God. It is recognizing who is in our life, in our family, in our social life, in our recreational life, in every aspect of our life. That's what worship is. It's a lifestyle that acknowledges God in all things. And by the way, around the world, there are different expressions of praise. It's not all the same. You know, you go to Hawaii, you go to the Hawaiian church, you know what, they have hula dancers, you know what, during the, the, during the praise. So they're out there worshiping, the hula dancers are out there, you know. You go to a Puerto Rican church, you know, Cuban church, and they're doing like salsa and they're doing cumbias, you know, and they're, you know, they're moving around. You go to a Spanish church in Mexico and they got mariachi or they got, you know, very Mexican or tenio music. You know what? God doesn't say, hey, time out, time out. I want you to do it the way the Old Testament Jews did it. That's not, God doesn't do that. You know what God looks at? He doesn't look at the expression. It pleases him, but he looks at the heart that's coming from that expression. What I do pray is that every person express their love to God according to their gifts, according to their personalities. And here's the truth of the matter. We prefer to worship God according to our personality and according to our gifts. That's the truth. Now, I, I have to, I, I've come to understand that a lot of people, a lot of Christians have a very difficult time just expressing love in general. You know, love unto God, love unto anybody else. Express praise to anybody else. You know, there, there are some people that just have a hard time saying thank you or appreciate it. And that has to do because of the way we were brought up. Some of us grew up in homes where our families did not express love and we didn't see it, you know, what demonstrated. So we have a hard time with it. You know, there are some that grew up in homes where they never hugged each other, where they never were expressive verbally or physically. 
So a lot of people struggle with the whole idea. When you come to church and we, we talk about praising the Lord and, and they say, lift your hands. Well, I'm not going to lift my hand. Well, shout out to the Lord. Well, I'm not going to shout. Well, sing to the Lord. Well, I'm not going to sing. Express your love. No, I'm not going to do that. You know why? Because you have a hard time. Not because it's wrong, but we struggle. Now, I understand that. And I get it. But I need you to understand something. You're part of a new family. You've been adopted into the family of God. You know what? You're not in an unexpressive, dysfunctional family anymore. Our Heavenly Father loves it when we worship Him and we express it. He loved it in the Old Testament. And while He doesn't, you know what, put a mold on all of us, there needs to be an expression that comes from our heart that is manifested physically sometimes in our singing, in our raising our hand, in our crying. You know what? Because we're telling the Lord, Lord, we love you. You know what? Jesus is the bride of Christ. We are, we are the, he is our husband. We are the bride. And he's not dysfunctional. And he is a loving, tender, touching, encouraging God. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Understand that. So here comes this guy. And you know what he's doing? He's expressing his gratitude by worshiping. You know, all of us can love God and express our love to God by our praise and our worship. And, and why is he doing it? You know what? Out of gratitude. He is grateful. And then I want you to notice the second thing that's very important. Not only is he grateful, but also, why was he grateful? A miracle happened in his life. Miracles produce gratitude. Now, I, I, there's a, there, there is a progression in this story that I don't want you to miss. And the progression says he expressed gratitude. He expressed he was grateful, so he worshiped. And the reason why he was grateful was because he had received a miracle. By the way, miracles produce gratitude. It says in verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. By the way, if you've ever received a miracle, you better be grateful. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. This guy was grateful. I mean, this guy was excited. He was tickled pink. I mean, this guy was, by the way, he was so happy. And you say, well, why? Well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you a couple of things about leprosy in those days. Leprosy was an infectious disease of the skin, attacked the nervous system. Does it exist today? Absolutely. It's called Hansen's disease. Today, leprosy has been cured, but it still exists. As a matter of fact, they tell us that there are over 200,000 new cases of leprosy somewhere around the world every year. It is estimated there are, there are three to four million people that suffer from leprosy around the world. And this is an irreversible disability. It causes blindness. It causes all kinds of uh, things to the body. As a matter of fact, they did a lot of research on this in the 1950s, and they found that what leprosy does is that it causes the nerve endings to deaden. They die, and you can't feel pain. So what actually, people that have leprosy, what actually happens is that they harm themselves, and they don't even know because they can't feel it. Something similar to diabetes. Those of you that have diabetes, you go to the doctors and he does this little thing. He tickles your foot. Have you noticed that? The bottom of your soul. And what he's trying to do to see if you still have feeling. Because there are people that have aggressive... Uh, 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 diabetes, thank you. They have aggressive diabetes. That after a while, they lose the, the feeling in their feet. And they could step on a nail or hurt or break their toe and not even feel it. Something like that. And in Jesus' days, there was no cure. And if you were a leper, you couldn't hold a job because you couldn't be around people because it was very contagious. As a matter of fact, you had to keep a certain distance from people if you were a leper. And if you were married and contracted leprosy, you could never see your family again. You could never go to your children's ball games. No, they didn't have baseball, but I'm just trying to make a point. Couldn't hang with them. You could never hold your wife again. You could never kiss your kids goodnight and tuck them into bed and read a story to them. Basically, in Jesus' days, you totally lost your life. You were an outcast of society. As a matter of fact, let me go as far as the law said, you have to stay a certain distance away. And usually what they did is that they had leper colonies. They had places where they had to live together, usually in caves, in the outskirts of the city, away from the population. And if you broke the rule and started hanging around people, you were put to death. Now, sometimes you would be out, the leper would be out collecting wood at his colony, and someone would be passing by, and the law said the leper had to shout, you know what, unclean, unclean. In other words, stay away, I am unclean. That was required. And if they didn't, they could be put to death. This guy had reason to be grateful. And by the way, you have reason to express your love to God. You have reason to be grateful. You know, God has done so many things for us. Can I hear a good amen to that? 
In the Bible, leprosy is a symbol of sin. You know, the Bible says when it talks about our condition, our spiritual condition, it uses the idea that we all have leprosy. And you know what leprosy does? You know what sin did? Like leprosy, it alienated us, not from society, it alienated us from God. The Bible says we all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says we all, like sheep, have gone astray. But when you and I ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives, the Bible says at that moment we're healed. There is a healing of our spiritual leprosy. Sin is dealt with. And you know what? We have a reason to be thankful. If Christ is in your life and you are a Christian, you have received the greatest healing anyone could ever experience. And it's the healing of your sin. It's the healing of salvation. It is spiritual healing. And Jesus Christ came to save the lost. Amen. By the way, it does you no good to get healed physically if you lose your soul. By the way, this guy was on his way to go. He was healed. Is it possible to get healed and not get saved? Absolutely. He was on his way out leaving, but he realized when he comes back, Jesus said, not only because of your faith were you healed, but because of your faith of coming back, you are so so, you are healed, you are made well spiritually, physically and spiritually. So this, this, this leper, as he, he understands that, and the Bible says that with a loud voice, he comes back and he expresses his gratitude. Why is he grateful? He received a miracle. You know, one of the things that I, I do want to call to your attention is this guy you know what? He's not, he's not quiet about it. He's loud. You know, sometimes we can be very critical of loud and overly passionate people. You know what? I want to suggest to you, don't be that way. You don't know what God has done for them. And sometimes, you know, there are some people that are so grateful. God has done such huge miracles, you know what, that they just want to praise the Lord. And they don't care what you think about it or what you think about it or what your opinion. They're grateful. They want to, they want to praise the Lord. So be mindful. Be understanding. As uncomfortable as that make, make, make you feel. I mean, I could tell you stories. I grew up in church where people were extremely passionate, extremely loud. Sometimes to the point of even being disruptive. And I did not understand it. And I used to think, why don't they shut those people up? Well, I know now why. They, 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 were, they, they were expressing their love. I didn't know what God had done. Not later on, I found out some of them were alcoholics that hung out at the dump. You know what? That were outcasts that had lost everything. And Jesus saved them. Listen, think about it. You get your life back. You get your family back. You get your career back. Things turn around. Your marriage is back on track. You, would, you should be grateful. Amen? Amen? I am grateful. All of us should be grateful. You know what? We're worshipers. You know what? As worshipers, we should be grateful. This guy was grateful. Why? You know what? And he's worshiping. Why? Because... He is grateful for a miracle. God does so many miracles. And then the third thing I want you to notice is that where did the, how did he get a miracle? His, great, his, his gratitude leads him to worship. He is worshiping because he's grateful. He's grateful because he's had a miracle. How did he get a miracle? He was obedient. Obedience produces miracles. Notice what it says in verse 14. He looked at them and said, go show yourself to the priest. This is Jesus. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. In other words, you know why he received a miracle? He obeyed. Now think about this. Jesus tells them, by the way, they're at a distance. They never come close to Jesus. Jesus doesn't lay hands on them. They, they, they sort of cry out, you know, have mercy on us. Jesus says, go, show yourself to the priests. And the Bible says they obeyed. Go, go. You know, they could have said, no, no, wait, Jesus. I'm not healed yet. The only time we go see the priest is when we have gotten healed. And what the priest did, the priest certified that they were healed and they could reintegrate into society. They could go back to the family. It took an order from the priest to be able to see that. And, and that's why they had to go to the priest. And they could have said to the Lord, 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 we're not healed. Lord, Lord, well, you know what? You're, you're, you're creating a problem for us. But the Bible says they obeyed Jesus. By the way, that obedience is called faith. And faith runs throughout all the Bible. Every time something miraculous happened, it was because of faith. And people's faith was seen in their obedience. I mean, there's tons of stories. I was tempted to give you a lot of stories. But let me just give you a few. Just in the Old Testament alone, you remember when Moses brings the people out of, the, out of Egypt and they're facing the Red Sea. And the enemy, the Egyptian army is coming. And to that side is, is desert. To that side is mountains. And, and, God, and Moses tells God, Lord, you, you put us in a pickle. What are we going to do? We're going to drown. The Bible says God looked to Moses and he says, what do you have in your hands? He says, well, I have a rod. And God told Moses, you know what? I want you to take that rod and I want you to strike the Red Sea. And when you strike the Red Sea, it's going to open. 
You know, Moses could have said, Lord, listen, the army is over there. We need a better plan than to hold up my stick and hit the Red Sea. That's not going to cut it. But God says, I want you to do it and watch what happens when you obey. You know what Moses did? He obeyed. And when he obeyed, because God told them, the Red Sea opened. And they didn't walk through muddy land. They walked through dry land. You know, sometimes God speaks to us and he says, listen, I need you to do what I tell you. I need you to obey. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't line up with everything that you know. But I'm, I know what I'm telling you and I want you to do it. And they did it. You know, later on, Joshua, after Moses dies, 40 years have gone by. And now he's ready to take the people into the promised land. And they got to cross the Jordan. And the Jordan was at a flood stage. Now, by the way, we have seen on the news what floods do. It takes cars, and we, we've seen flood water maybe this high, and the devastation that it does. No, the Jordan, when it would flood in Jesus' days, it was 20, 30 feet of rushing water. And, and God speaks to Joshua. He says, it's time to cross over. And, and Joshua says, hey, Lord, it's flood stage. Let's do it when it's not flooding. It'll be a lot easier. And God says, no, I, I want to do it now. And I want you to go... Line up the people, and I want you to tell the priests that are holding the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to tell them to put their feet in the Jordan River, and when they put their feet in, I'm going to open the Jordan River. Now, I can imagine Joshua saying, Lord, listen, no, no. First of all, I don't know if I'm going to be able to convince the, the, the priest to do that. That's scary. But you know what? I remember what you did with Moses. Why don't I get my little staff and hit it, and why don't you open it that way? Isn't it amazing how we want to negotiate with God? And the Bible says God told him, no, no, I want you to do it. And you know what? The Bible says that when he did it, the Bible says that the, the, the Jordan River, the waters, you know what, halted, and they crossed into the promised land. Here's my point. We think sometimes we know better than God. Sometimes we think, no, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. But when God speaks, we need to obey. And when we obey, there's a miracle. And when there's a miracle, we're grateful. And when we're grateful, then we worship God. We express that gratitude to the Lord. Now, we're talking about obedience. So this is what the story is. The story is because they obeyed, he received a miracle. Because he had a miracle, he was grateful. And because he was, great, they, he was grateful, he came and he worshiped and he gave thanks to the Lord. That's the progression of the story. What's the catcher is why Jesus told that story. You know, a lot of times we read that story and we know the story well. What we don't know is why did Jesus tell him that story? Well, to understand that, you have to read the first 10 verses of Luke 17. I want to read it to you, and then I want to tie it together, because the, the, the subject is obedience. The subject, what he wanted the people to know, not only are we to be grateful, but gratefulness happens because we receive miracles, and we receive miracles because we're obedient. What kicks it all off is our obedience and are acting in faith. That's what, that's what triggers it. So notice what the story says in, in Luke 17, 1 to 10. Notice what it says. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptation to sin, but what sorrow awaits the person who does tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with the millstone hung around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. Now verse 2 explains verse 1. When he talks about temptation, what is he talking about? He's talking about people that offend us. People who make it their business to make our life miserable. People who want to hurt us and talk bad about us. And Jesus said, oh, I feel sorry for those people because they don't realize that they're bringing huge judgment upon themselves. So he's talking first. He starts here talking about those that offend. You know what? Those people that are evil and intend on doing you wrong. Then he goes on and he says to those that are offended. Offenders, now the offended. He said, go watch yourself. If another believer sins, so watch yourself. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there is repentance, forgive them. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, Lord, show us to increase our faith. In other words, Jesus said, hey, listen, guys, you will be offended. People will do you wrong. It's going to happen. There are bad people, and there are, they are even in the church. They are among Christians. You know, we, we expect non-Christians to do us wrong and, and, and all of that, but Christians, we don't expect that. But Jesus said they're going to be all around. Now, now, people should not offend, but they do. But here's what Jesus says. I want to say to you, if you get offended, if somebody says something against you, I want you to forgive them. I want you to forgive them. 
Well, the disciple says, that's no problem, Lord. We can do that. The Lord says, no, no, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm not finished yet. If that same person offends you not once, but seven times on the same day, I want you to forgive them also. The disciple says, well, Lord, that, that's going to be a little harder. I mean, that's going to take a little bit more work. That's going to take a little bit more faith. That's going to take a little bit more of your help. So why don't you give us more faith? Help us with our faith. Help us to, you know what, to be able to be more spiritual and help us to be, you know what, get a greater grasp. We're going to have to understand. Lord, give us a talk on, on forgiveness and exactly what do we need to do. That's what they're telling the Lord. I want you to notice his response. Jesus in verse 6, it says, the Lord answered and he says, if you had faith, even as, a, as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now, he uses the word here, obedience, because he's talking about obedience. He tells him, no, no, you, you don't need more faith. What you need, you need to be obedient. That's what you need to do. Then he goes on, and he tells this story, starting in verse 7, that seems to be off track, and we don't connect it, but I'm going to connect it for you. Look what he says in verse 7. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No. He says, prepare my meal. Put on your apron, serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have simply done our duty. In other words, I want you to catch what's being said. When you combine the whole story, all chapter 17, everything that's just happened, Here's what the Lord says. The Lord says, you will be offended. There are knucklehead, crazy, evil, bad people out there. Some of them might be Christians. You need to forgive them. What if they offend me seven times in one day? Seven times. And they say, okay, but Lord, we're going to need your help. We're going to need more faith. And here's what Jesus says. You don't need more faith. You simply need to obey. You need to do what I told you to do. You are my servants. I am your master. Do it. All right? It's not a matter of faith. You, it's not that you need more faith. It's a matter, you just need little faith. It's a matter of you just being obedient. You know, so many times, don't we go and tell the Lord, Lord, uh, help me with my faith. The Lord says, you have more than enough faith. Lord, help me understand. You understand more than you need to understand. What you need to do is you need to go out and be obedient. Do the right thing that you know that you're supposed to do, that I've told you to do. That's what you need to do. But here's the thing, to be obedient, it requires faith. Doing the right thing requires faith, requires knowing that God's got this. So here, then he tells the story of these 10 lepers. And the reason why he tells the story of the 10 lepers is because they were thankful. But one of the reasons they were healed, the reason they were healed, they were obedient. Obedience, you know what, leads to uh, uh, miracles and miracles lead to gratitude. And that's why only one of them comes back and he says, listen, I, I'm grateful. What Jesus is telling them, you have a part to play. You know, you, have a, you need to be thankful, but you have to be obedient. That's what you need. When he told them, go show yourself to the priest, and they went. You know what? They were obedient. As, I love what it says, as they went. As they're going. Now think about how crazy it is. Go. And in going, they're healed. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, so many times, you know, and let me sort of apply this, to take it a different direction. You know, all, so many times, all of the problems that we're carrying around, you know, a lot of them, you could trace them back to an unforgiving heart, lack of forgiveness. You know, when you're not forgiving, you're not doing what Jesus said. And when you're not doing what Jesus said, and you might have all the excuses you want, you are being disobedient. And when there is disobedience, you are forfeiting the favor of God, the miracles of God. Moses and Joshua and these lepers would never have experienced miracles if they had not been obedient to what they were told to do. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what it's all about. Giving thanks and the importance of giving thanks. You know, so many times we're, 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 we just think, well, Pastor, you know, I, I don't have too much to be thankful for. I mean, you know, I, actually, you know, not only am I not thankful, I'm sort of mad at God. And I'm sort of mad at God because, you know what, even though he's done a lot of good things, there's a lot of good things he hasn't done. And sometimes we focus more on what he hasn't done than what he has done. You know, when you really think about it, God has done a lot for you and for me. Can I hear a good amen to that? 
Now, in case, yes, give the Lord a hand clap, please. Now, in case you have forgotten, let me tell you, first of all, what he has done. If you are a Christian and you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, you have received the greatest miracle any human being could receive. And that is spiritual healing. That is the forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's amazing. There's nothing more important than that. Everything else is icing on the cake. You know what? The fact that when I die and I take my last breath, I'm going to go be in the presence of God. I'm going to eternity to be with my Lord. I didn't earn that. I didn't deserve it. It's a miracle that Jesus Christ, and not only that, the fact that he's kept you all these years, 45 years for me, he's kept me. It is a miracle. Still blows my mind. Don't forget that. We take for granted the miracle of salvation. You know why? Because we want to focus on all the other miracles. You have the greatest miracle. The good news is that's not the only one he wants to do. He wants to do others. But here's another thing that I want you to understand. You know what? There are all these miracles that he's done that we forget about because they're not important. They're insignificant. You know, sometimes you're praying for that job and you know it's a miracle and you get it when you shouldn't have got it and you forget. Oh, you know what? I, I said I worked hard and I guess I was the most qualified. No, you weren't. It was a miracle from God. God ordered the steps. Amen. Or this or that. Think of all of those miracles the Lord has done. And you have lost track of them because you're chalking them up as a coincidence. Or maybe because I, I was diligent or I worked hard. But no, they're miracles. That son, that daughter, that marriage that was going south. You know what? That was going the wrong direction and you prayed. And God intervened. You know what? And because it did not happen that way. It happened over a, a period. You lost track of, you know what? Seeing God move. But it was a miracle. You know, I, I think a lot of times miracles that God does, they're, they're gradual. It's like losing weight. Have you ever been heavy and then three months later someone sees you and says, wow, you lost a lot of weight. You look and he says, what? Really? You know what? You're so used to living with it that you, it, you looking in the mirror, it doesn't look like you've lost weight. And sometimes God does things in our lives that, you know what? Because they happen progressively over a period of time, we don't think they're miracles. God does miracles. You know, you went to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know what, I'm sort of concerned. I see in the x-ray these spots, and, and you know what, they're there. We need to look closer, and they go, and they look again. They do. They're not there. And you say, well, the doctor says, oh, I think I made a mistake. No, he didn't make a mistake. God did a miracle. Amen. That's what happened. Amen. But you know, you know, I was thinking uh, during Thanksgiving, you know, you know another reason you should be thankful? Because of so much food that we have. That probably explains why over half of Americans are overweight. Not overweight, they're obese. Now, Pastor, did you need to say that? No, I didn't. Forgive me. That's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> Amen. Man, two-thirds of the world doesn't have the spread that you and I enjoyed Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and some of you are going to continue today. Amen. It's a miracle. We should be thankful. You know, when we pray for our food, I don't know about you, but every Thanksgiving we pray for our food and... Uh, you know, we, we, we say, let's bless the food. You know, Jesus never blessed his food. Even though the Bible teaches that we are to say a blessing, bless everything, bless our food. But you know what Jesus did? Every time he broke bread, he gave thanks. The Bible says that he took the bread and he broke it and he said thanks. The Bible says he goes to the tomb of, 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 uh, of Lazarus and the first thing he says is, Lord, thank you for hearing me. He gave thanks. You know who started this thing of thanksgiving? It wasn't the pilgrims. Actually, they did it in the Old Testament, but Jesus is the one that started giving thanks for our meals. You know, it's like Jesus saying, hey, listen, I, I know you guys take this for granted, but this bread, this is a miracle that your heavenly Father provided for you. So give thanks and be grateful. My prayer is that you would live a, a life of gratitude. And I, I, I want you to notice what, what gratitude does in our lives. You know, I, I want you to catch from today what gratitude does. You know, well, gratitude leads to worship. The reason we're grateful is because of the miracles God has done. The reason why we have seen God move in our lives is because we've been people of faith and we have been obedience. Miracles have been released. You know what? Because God honors obedience. God honors faith. You know what? But one of the things that God expects us to do as a result of what he's done is to worship him and to be grateful. The worship team is going to come up right now and uh, I want to I wanna pray for you. And I, I, I want you to bow your heads right where you're at. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to, just for one moment, I want you to just say to God, and 
the Holy Spirit. Lord, what, what are you saying to me through this message today? Well, let me suggest one of the things that he's saying is that all those miracles that God has done in your life, you know, don't let the devil, don't let the enemy focus you on things that didn't turn out the way you wanted. And one of the things that I pray happens is that you realize, yes, in the small things, God is there. I pray that you would see what God has done in your life. And sometimes when we go through difficult times, all we see is the difficulties of the moment. We don't see the good times and the good things that have happened throughout the years. We forget. And when we forget, we lose strength and we become discouraged. And we say, I have nothing to be thankful for. You know, we're here today. And God wanted to remind us this Sunday after Thanksgiving, my people, you have so much to be grateful for. I've done so much for you. Some of you might be here this morning and you say, Pastor, you know, finances are not well. My health is not well. Situation at job is pretty bleak. Marriage is not good. Family relationships. There's a lot of areas where you're right. I focus on those. And when I focus on them, I don't think I have too much to be grateful for. But you're right. So what I want to do in a few minutes after I pray, I want to invite you to the altar. You know, you don't have to be a member of our church to come for prayer. This might be your first time. It might be your second time. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've only been here a short time. You think, well, that's only for, for people that have been around for a long time. No, no. It is for you. If you need prayer for any area of your life, we serve a, a miracle working God. And one of the things God does when we gather is that he, he shows us steps that we need to take. And we need to be obedient. And once we are obedient, God does some amazing things. Those guys were healed because they were obedient. And because they were healed, you know what? Because they were obedient, they, they were, you know what? They, they had a miracle. Because they had a miracle, they were grateful. Because they were grateful, they're worshiping the Lord. You know, I was a 16-year-old boy when I gave my life to the Lord. And he changed everything. As I look back, I was reflecting this past week. You know, not only did he save me 45 years ago, but I, I haven't had a desire to go back to that old life. One of my desires has been to walk with the Lord and learn more about him every day. And a lot of people helped me. You know, a lot of people prayed for me. And uh, throughout these years, it just amazes me what God does. I have so much to be grateful. Brought my life, brought my wife into my life with children, grandchildren. And I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a blessed man. You know, if you're here today, you have a lot to be grateful for. You've given him your life. He's forgiven you of all your sins. You're on your way to heaven. You know what? He's got your back. He's got you. You're in his hands. And nothing can pluck you out of his hands. Father God, we thank you today. And Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll draw every person that needs prayer. And Lord, we do. You know, Lord, we've become very knowledgeable and know a lot about your word, but we've become terrible at obe obeying it. And Father, maybe that explains why sometimes we don't see as much in our lives as we would like to see. We know the right, but we don't do it. We know what you said and what you've spoken to our hearts, but we rationalize it away. I pray that as a result of today, we would not do that. Obedience leads to miracles. Father, do a miracle in the lives of your people. Today in faith we come. Your word says that, Lord, you draw near to those who draw near to you. We're going to do that right now. Your word says that we have not because we ask not. Your word says ask and you shall receive. Knock and it should be open. Seek and you shall find. Lord, today we come with a thankful heart, opening our hearts to you, acknowledging our need of you. Father, I commit to you our families our marriages, our children. Lord, the good things and the bad things and the ugly things. The things we would rather not deal with, but are forced to as a result of your desire for us to grow and mature. I commit your people to you today. I do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?